Okay, so uh, this is just simply titled Paul After Acts, and by that I mean the Book of Acts. And as you see in the notes, the book rather abruptly ends uh, when we began our study on the Book of Acts. We looked at some of the reasoning as far as why it was written, and very possibly it was a book that Luke was putting together at Paul's behest uh, that would become a part of his uh, his defense as he went before the emperor at that time. But at the end of the book of Acts, we read Acts 28 verses 30 and 31. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So again, then a rather abrupt ending, but again, as we have covered before, this best we can conclude, this is right around 62 AD, his imprisonment, 60 to 62, and probably right after that, uh, in 63, he is released and he is free to travel at large, and it appears that he did. So uh, let's, uh, let me scroll up a little. There may have been four or five more years that Paul lived, and sadly, there's no scriptural record of where he traveled, uh, of just kind of the, 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 the travails that he went through, as it seems that Paul always did. But just to get our bearings here in the 60s AD, uh, again, Paul released around 63. But let's remember a couple of things that took place in the Roman Empire that was going to dramatically change the view that the Roman Empire had toward Judaism, but you see also they viewed Christianity, again, from the Roman point of view, they viewed it as just being a part of Judaism. And so since the Christian church began among the Jewish community and then spread, it was viewed as being an appendage of, Jew, of the Jews. And so they were given a lot of, uh, a lot of freedom, a lot of consideration until a couple of events. 64 AD, just devastating fires in Rome. And you probably remember from history that they're, they're, well, there's a lot of evidence that shows that Nero was behind having the fires set. That he saw himself as this great builder and he wanted to clear out some of the areas so he could rebuild it. But he had to have a scapegoat, and so Nero blamed the Christians, the, the early Christian church. From that time, the Roman Empire had a very negative view of these followers of the one from Nazareth named Jesus. Okay, so 64 to 66, maybe a little more than that. We have Paul free at large, traveling, visiting again some of the congregations where he had been, and then perhaps going to other areas. We'll comment on that shortly. The other great event in 66 is when the Jews revolted from Rome. And so the Roman view of the Jews is never the same again. In fact, they were at war. Uh, the uh, the Romans, it took a while to muster their forces, first of all, down at Alexandria, Egypt, under General Vespasian. They moved up to Jerusalem and were beginning to surround it when events back in Rome took place where, well, Nero died probably late 67, I think it was. And they had two or three very quick, uh, well, short periods of time where someone was named Emperor 
See, Nero ended the line that goes all the way back to Julius Caesar. So now they don't have a family line to follow. Uh, finally, then the general Vespasian was called back to Rome and he became emperor. So the Roman legions pulled back for a while. Vespasian's son Titus then led the Romans as they again encircled, besieged, and ultimately overthrew uh, the uh, city of Jerusalem and destroyed all of it, including the temple. So 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed. I skipped over 68 around Pentecost from what Josephus writes. There was a, a voice they heard from the temple, essentially, let us remove hence. Let's get out of here. And the church fled north and across the Jordan to a little out of the, out of the way place called Pella. Now, we need to be aware of the facts that there are modern scholars who questioned whether Paul was ever released and then had a second imprisonment that led to his death. Um, most scholars will agree that there had to have been this, this interim period. But when we go down this direction of trying to piece together, just realize that the Bible doesn't just lay it all out for us just in plain, clear language like Luke had been doing in the book of Acts. So we have evidence, we have to piece it together. But it is interesting that a few of the early church writers, first, second, third centuries, made comments about Paul Paul going to the extremity of the West, we'll look at some of those a little bit, but all of them that wrote unanim unanimously agreed that Paul was set free and he had a period of time to travel until he was then taken once again. But uh, again, as I have here in the notes, since the Bible does not expressly give us the time frame and the events and the travels to follow, we need to be very, very careful. In fact, I have here the, uh, the Life and Epistles of St. Paul. Uh, this book, in fact, I have a picture on it here when I scroll up in just a moment. Uh, this volume was used for decades uh, at Ambassador College as our primary textbook for the class, the Epistles of Paul. So Coney uh, Bear and Hausen are the, the two authors and page 737, as they finish the book of Acts and they're looking forward, they said the progress of the historian who traces, who attempts to trace the footsteps of the apostles beyond the limits of the scriptural narrative must at least be hesitating and uncertain. So what we're going to be looking at here tonight, let's, let's realize that the, the, these are clues. They're, these are pieces of evidence that we're going to try to fit together because, um, again, we want to be very, very careful. All right, now I'll scroll on up. Here is uh, the, the, the copy that I have, the paper sleeve around it that looked like this is long, long gone. In fact, uh, inside the front cover, mine says October 18th, 1972. So I've had that one a long time and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a classic. So we're left with the question, the book of Acts abruptly ends. There, there, there are clues here and there that Paul was around and traveling. Where do we look? Well, again, scrolling up. We first of all remember that Paul wrote four books from prison in Rome. So when he wrote a letter and sent it out, there are statements, it seems like little statements in passing, but that give evidence that can be fitted together. 
So he wrote to Philemon, uh, Philemon, which was his, um, his, his singular personal private letter. But then he also wrote to the church at Philippi, Philippians. He wrote to the church at Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. And then he wrote to the area of Colossae. And it may have been, there's evidence, it may have been to the whole region around there, Colossae, uh, Laodicea, Hierapolis, they were all right in that area. But these are called the prison epistles. And I would add, if he is the, the author of Hebrews, and I personally believe he was, but we also have to be careful there because the Bible doesn't say, and the book of Hebrews is not signed. Nowhere does it say, I, Paul, and write, I'm writing to you. As all of the other epistles of Paul and general epistles do have the name of an author. If he wrote Hebrews, it was written right about the time he was set free, but still in Italy. And we'll look a little later at the statement he makes uh, late in Hebrews. Okay, after he's released, he wrote pastoral epistles. So a pastoral epistles, as it implies, this is Paul writing a church pastor. So first of all, he wrote the first letter to Timothy. Then shortly thereafter, he wrote Titus. And this was between his two imprisonments. And then finally, he wrote another pastoral epistle, the second letter back to Timothy, after he had been recaptured and had been sentenced to die and was just waiting until that day came. So it is from these letters that we find clues as far as where Paul may have traveled and preached after the book of Acts concludes. There are some additional clues toward the end of, I think it's chapter 15 of the book of Romans. So we're, we're going to start with Paul's prison epistles and this personal epistle to Philemon. So if you will, uh, I don't have the actual scripture here, so you'll need to follow along. But in Philippians 2, again, he's in prison in Rome. He's writing to Philippi. And he says that, um, uh, or 17, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering. So again, this is his first imprisonment. He didn't know how it was going to go. But he was... He was set free the first time. Uh, holding fast the word of life. Um, oh, that's for, that's back up verse 16. Let's uh, drop on down to verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. So Paul is there in Rome. He has several who come and go as far as elders and key pillars who are there helping him. Timothy was there at certain times, but he is intending to send Timothy to Philippi. He says that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. So here's Paul. He's deprived of any liberty. People can come and go to see him, but he also is looking back at these congregations that God used him to raise up, and he's not getting any information. So he wants Timothy to come, and then Timothy will bring back information. And then he commands Timothy very highly. I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. All seek their own. But let's see, verse 24. Verse 24, therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. So he is expecting, oh, that, that was verse 23, pardon me. He's expecting an answer soon. 
Verse 24, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall come, shall also come shortly. So Paul expects to be able to go there himself after he is released. And it appears that he did. Now he goes on to Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, uh, verse 25, uh, yet I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. You see, Paul highly commended the church at Philippi because on occasions, I mean, Paul's sitting there in Rome, he has certain needs and they're sending support. Food, money, we, we aren't told. But Epaphroditus was from Philippi. He brought supplies, and Paul is now going to send him back. In fact, may have taken this letter anyhow. Verse 26, uh, since he was longing for you all, so Epaphroditus wanted to go back home and was distressed because you heard that he, had, he was sick. Or indeed, he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So, verse 28, therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. So, I think that's uh, that's clear enough. Now let's go to chapter four, Ephesians four, and we'll pick it up in verse fifteen. Verse fifteen. Now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, uh, Philippi is up in the area of Troas. Uh, uh, Apollonia, Berea is probably a little bit further over, maybe it's not considered Macedonia, but those far north uh, west, or excuse me, northeastern areas of Greece. No church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Verse 18, indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things which uh, sent from you a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. And God will provide you your need uh, according to his, uh, his riches in glory. Now, some of the manuscripts, it, you know, just he signs off here, verses 21, 2, 3. Uh, some of the manus manuscripts indicate at the end that Epaphroditus was also the scribe who actually wrote down the letter. You will remember there are places where Paul would sign a letter with a large, you know, with a large writing. So different things indicate he had a vision problem. So Epaphroditus may have been the one who actually wrote down what Paul dictated as this letter. And then certain manuscripts will add the note at the end to the Philippians written from Rome by Epaphroditus. So he may have written the letter, and then he was likely the one, since he was being sent to Philippi, to uh, take the letter and present it to the, uh, the congregation there. All right, now we're going to go to the little book of Philemon. And again, I'm sure you basically remember Philemon, little short book of 25 verses, a personal letter Paul wrote to a member named Philemon. Uh, commentators mention he was a wealthy member in Colossae. So he's over in the area of Colossae. And what had happened was Philemon had 
a slave, a servant. The slave's name was Onesimus. He had run away. But it seems that he ran away with, a, with an objective in mind because he ends up in Rome with Paul. And, of course, while he is there, he ends up being baptized. He is converted. Uh, Philemon, as uh, having been a servant in, uh, excuse me, Onesimus, having been a servant in Philemon's house in Colossae, may have remembered or knew Paul from back when Paul was traveling in the area establishing congregations. Um, be that as it may, uh, ultimately, of course, Paul is telling Onesimus, go back home, go back to your master. What you did is wrong, but I'm going to send you, and this time you're going not as his slave, but as his brother in Christ. So looking here at verse 22, but meanwhile... Also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. Now, it's been a year or two, but I gave a sermon where we went through the little book of Philemon and what a masterpiece of tact and diplomacy it is. And so Paul has made his appeal to Philemon to do the right thing and receive Onesimus back. But then he reminds him, just as kind of a little gentle pressure, that, by the way, when I'm free, I'm going to come there too, and I'm going to stay with you. Probably he had stayed there before. So I have my room ready. Verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you as do Mark, that'd be John Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. So he has quite a, quite a group there with him at that time. Now, the King James Version at the end of Philemon has a note that the translators added, written from Rome to Philemon by Onesimus, a servant. So it's implying that Onesimus in this book may have been the one actually writing it down and then being one, we'll see here in the next, uh, in, in Colossians, that Tychicus was sent also to Colossae. So he and Onesimus would have traveled together. Okay, so let's go to Colossians 4, beginning in verse 7. Colossians 4, verse 7. Verse 7, Tychicus. He is mentioned in the book of Acts um, as far as being one, there at one point with Paul's travels. Tychicus, a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. So Paul is sending a letter to Colossae in that region. Tychicus is going. Tychicus will let them know firsthand how Paul is doing, how the case is going, and all of that. Verse 8, I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. So also, he's Paul's emissary to go to Colossae and to find out how's Colossae doing to then get information back to Paul. But he's not going alone. Verse 9, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Paul doesn't call him Philemon's slave. This is a man who is now a brother in Christ. Then he continues, who is one of you? So Onesimus was from Colossae. They, so Tychicus and Onesimus, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Then verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. You know, this is just mentioned in passing. We don't know why 
Aristarchus was an actual prisoner along with Paul. Apparently, Luke was just there and able to gather information and and maybe treat some of Paul's wounds. But um, Aristarchus specifically was a fellow prisoner with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. So John Mark is there, relative of Barnabas. Verse 11, and Jesus, who is called Justice. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. So these are Jewish Christians. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you. So Epaphras is also from Colossae. A bondservant of Christ greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. So this, this statement is why commentators generally view the book of Colossians was really sent to Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea, since they were all right in that same little area. And let's see, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you, greet the house, or greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that is in his house. Okay, next, let's go over to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. And just read verses 21 and 22. 21 and 22. Verse 21, but that you may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. And then he signs off the letter to those at Ephesus. So Tychicus is being sent. Let's consider the book of Hebrews again. We'll probably in this life not know for sure who wrote it. But a, a lot of us, in fact, the old King James used to, I mean, it just said right in the title you know, that it was written by Paul. But we, uh, again, we need to be fair with that. In Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, just notice verses 18 and 19, first of all. Pray for us. We are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live on honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. So just the way that is worded, it reads like an appeal to pray for me so that I can be set free and come to you the sooner. Well, he gets to his farewell, but let's drop down to verse 24. Verse 24, greet all those who rule over you. So common thread in a letter written to a congregation or congregations. Uh, tell the elders there I said hi. And all the saints. And then he, verse 24, the latter part, he says, those from Italy greet you. And so the thinking here is, and again, the way it's worded, the author sends greetings from members and elders in Italy to those receiving the letter, kind of a general epistle to the Hebrews. And we're left with a question. Could Paul have written these words from Rome shortly after his initial release, but before he had left Italy? 
Well, we don't have an answer. We don't have, we don't know how to answer that, but it, it does, it is interesting to file away and consider. All right, let's go now to his first two pastoral epistles. Uh, it, again, it's interesting Th those who challenge whether Paul had two different times of imprisonment with a, an interim of three to five years in between, those who challenge that have difficulty explaining away some of the evidence that is provided in the pastoral epistles because there are statements, there are facts that are given that do not cannot fit into any other time of Paul's life, especially the three missionary journeys that Luke was writing about. The only way it fits is if there was a first imprisonment, a release, a period of time when he's free, free to travel, and then a second imprisonment with leading to his execution. But the pastoral epistles will state that Paul traveled to Ephesus, Crete, Macedonia, Miletus. Now, that was the little seaport about 20 miles south of Ephesus, and Nicopolis, back up, back up in Macedonia, which is where it appears he was recaptured, but that's a few years down the line. So chronologically, the first pastoral letter Paul wrote was his first letter to Timothy. So let's go to 1 Timothy 1 and begin in verse 3. 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, Remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. All right. Paul is writing Timothy. Paul was back in Macedonia, but he didn't stay there. I mean, I mean he, he was back in Ephesus. He did not stay at Ephesus. He went to Macedonia, but he left. Timothy in Ephesus to address some errors. You see, things had happened. There was this growing movement of Gnosticism, and there were some really strange and demonic doctrines that were coming out. They were having to battle them. Now, when Paul was in Ephesus back in the book of Acts, that's where there was this great riot there at the Temple of Diana. Uh, he had a lot of resistance, but mainly it was from within the Jews of Asia. He was not dealing with doctrinal error and heresy at that time, but now they are dealing with, with heresy. Verse 4, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. And that's something good to keep tucked away. Sometimes some, a, a teaching, an attitude just doesn't feel right. Uh, there's probably a reason. Um, God's truth builds us up, it encourages, it comforts, but uh, Satan's deception uh, leads to disputes. Verse 5, now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Verse 6, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. So the book of Acts, again, with Paul's travels, it does not tell us of Timothy being left in Ephesus to combat errors. And now he is being left there. 
there are those straying from the truth. There are those bringing heresy. There are those who want to be viewed, seen as being teachers of the law. So if 1 Timothy was written between the two imprisonments, everything fits together. It, it harmonizes. But this letter tells us he had obviously been in Ephesus and then went to Macedonia. Uh, it is possible, but we aren't told. He may have, since he's in Ephesus, gone on over to Colossae to visit Philemon, Onesimus, and the nearby areas. Now let's go to Titus. This was Paul's second pastoral epistle to write. Titus 1, beginning in verse 4. Titus 1, verse 4. To Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Verse 5, Paul just sends his greetings and then, bloom, you know, here's why I'm writing. For this reason, I left you, Titus, in Crete. Okay, by making that statement, that tells us that Paul must have been on Crete. We know that in the first journey, missionary journey, when Paul and Barnabas traveled together, they went to, excuse me, wait a minute, I said Crete. Maybe it was Cyprus, I didn't check that. I think, I think that Barnabas was from Cyprus. Anyhow, scratch that thought. Paul had been in Crete, so seems like maybe from Ephesus they made a quick trip down, and then Paul went back up, but he left Titus there because things were lacking. To set things in order, the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city. And then he gives criteria for how to weigh the fruits being produced in someone's life, whether they can be cons considered for ordination as an elder. Now let's go a little further into Titus, to Titus chapter 3. Titus 3, and let's drop down, pick it up in verse 9. Paul tells Titus something rather similar to what he had also told Timothy. Verse 9, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. So it's like what he wrote to Timothy in Ephesus and what he's writing to Titus here on Crete, they're combating the same kinds of problems which tells us it's taking place at about the same time. Verse 10, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Verse 12, when I sent Artemis to you, or when, when I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, so he was going to send one or the other, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. So now file that one away. Apparently he was wintering in Nicopolis, and that's when he was taken captive the second time. Send Zenus, verse 13, send Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste, so they lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. And then he signs off. Farewell, grace to you, amen. Let's consider now the question, did Paul travel to Spain? Did Paul travel to Spain? All right, let's go to Romans 
15. And we should read Paul's statement to Rome years earlier that he planned to come and see them on his way to Spain. You see, when Paul wrote the letter of Romans, he had not been to Rome yet. There was a church there. There could have been some from, you know, the Acts chapter 2 Pentecost in Jerusalem who went who went there, or others may have traveled there, but there was a there was a church, and he wrote to it, but he had not been there yet, but he wanted to be there. So he most likely wrote to the brethren at Rome several years earlier when he was in Corinth spending a winter. Now you can make a note there of Acts 20, verse 3. He came to Greece and stayed three months. It's generally thought that's the conclusion that Coney Barrenhausen come to, uh, other commentators come to, that during that wintering time, he wrote his letter to the church at Rome. So in verse uh, 22, for this reason, I also have been much hinder hindered from coming to you. Well, Paul was facing stumbling blocks and, and uh, just difficulties his entire ministerial life. He wanted to go there earlier, but lots of things hindered him. Verse 23, but now no longer having a desire in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, Verse 24, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. So he expresses his intention of coming. He was going to go to Rome and then go to Spain. But notice verse 25. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Now, this speaks of what he mentioned many times in Acts and in his other epistles, that he was gathering this collection for the poor saints in Judea. So he's saying, I have these supplies. I'm going to take them to Jerusalem first. Then he intended to come their direction. However, Paul goes to Jerusalem, and that's what led to the riot. That's what led to the Roman soldiers taking him captive. Later then, he's in Caesarea two years. He travels the shipwreck, winters on Malta, goes to Rome. He's there two years. So... Paul's trip to Rome and then on, well, Paul's trip to Rome came about by other circumstances. But he still mentioned, I want to go to Rome and then I want to go to Spain. But he first was going to take the goods to Jerusalem. Verse 26, 26 for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Okay, so I think that's as far as we'll read there. Now, Spain. It is interesting. I've, you know, I've got several works here. I'll show you pictures of some of these works that have a lot of, a lot of wonderful food for thought. I, I realize everyone is not interested, but some of us are. But Coney Baron Housen, Life and Epistles of St. Paul. They list a number of early sources that, stating, that stated that Paul did preach the gospel in Spain. So let's look at a few of those. Uh, a, I have listed a man whose name is Clement. Clement was a disciple Paul mentioned in passing in Philippians 4, verse 3, one of his prison epistles. Um, it is 
generally understood this Clement later became the church pastor at Rome. There is a letter, and this is, this is uh, first century, first century AD. There is a letter from this Clement written to the Corinthian church. In it, he stated that Paul preached the gospel in the East and in the West, end quote. Now, Coney Barenhausen, in this letter from Clement a little later, Clement states that Paul had instructed the whole world, that is, the Roman Empire, which was commonly so called in righteousness. So Clement a little later says, Paul preached the whole, to the whole world, which from their day and age, that's the basic Mediterranean world where the Roman Empire existed. Again, a little later in the same letter, Clement wrote that Paul had gone to the extremity of the West before his martyrdom. Now, Coney Barenhausen point out that that phrase, extremity of the West, was commonly used by Roman writers in a reference to Spain. So this early church elder, pastor, in writing a letter, just was adamant, just took it for granted that Paul ended up preaching in Spain. Now, if we go a little later in time, there is what is called the moratorium, uh, moratorian, or moratorius canon. And this was an early gathering of the books of, of the New Testament. It is not known who the Christian was who was gathering then, but the Muratorian canon came out around 170 AD. It was the earliest, um, the earliest canon or gathering of the New Testament books that uh, that you know that we have. It states, okay, it, it has a, the, these books listed. I believe that's when there were 27, you know, like we have today. But there was a document that accompanied the books. The document, when it's talking about the book of Acts, it mentions Luke relates to Theophilus, events of which he was eyewitness. Okay, then there's a couple of sentences I skipped over. Uh, but omits the, the journey of Paul from Rome to, Rome to Spain. So here is this canon, 170 AD, and the letter explaining it mentions, for some reason, Luke, in writing the book of Acts, skipped over the part about Paul going to Spain. So they take it for granted. Then there is Eusebius. Okay, early fourth century. So I think he died in the 330s. So, you know, right after the turn of that century, 310s to 320, somewhere through there, he is writing his ecclesiastical history, church history. And Eusebius writes in one point, after defending himself successfully, it is currently reported that the apostle again went forth to proclaim the gospel and afterwards to Rome a second time and was martyred under Nero. Now, the main thing Eusebius adds here is Paul was in prison and he was released. He preached the gospel, then he's in prison again, and this time he was killed. Okay, there is an early writer named Chrysostom, fourth, uh, late 4th century, so late 300s AD. Chrysostom, in a letter, wrote, St. Paul, after his residence in Rome, departed to Spain. So that understands that Paul was in Rome, but he was set free, and then he went to Spain. 
And then there is Jerome, the uh, Catholic saint. He too, late fourth century, so late 300s. Jerome wrote, Paul was dismissed by Nero that he might preach Christ's gospel in the West. Again, the West and the extremity of the West to a Roman writer at that time, that meant Spain. So the early church writers we have here, universally, you know, most don't mention it, but those who did write about Paul being released universally believed that after he was released, he preached the gospel for several years before being recaptured and executed. Uh, Cody Bear, uh, the uh, Life and Epistles of St. Paul, the authors believe that Paul would have arrived in Spain circa that's approximately or about 64 AD. So he's set free in 63, could have had time to go to Ephesus, down to, down to uh, Crete and back up, possibly even go over to Laodicea, uh, Laodicea and Colossae, then go to the west. So 64 AD, they also say the evidence points to being two years there. Then he went back to Ephesus, and then that's when he went to Macedonia for his uh, final wintering there at Nicopolis. So it is during this time that a number of traditions indicate that Paul visited the British Isles. Now, I will, you know, this, this, this work by Coney Baron Halson is kind of the, the seminal work as far as Paul, where he traveled, where he went, where he ministered. They do not really discuss the possibility of Paul traveling to Britain. The authors just take the view that the historical sources that are used are just simply too unreliable. So I think we need to file that away as well. And as we read from Coney Bear at the beginning, let us tread very carefully. Um, we don't want to paint ourselves into a corner as far as just absolutely stating that Paul went to Britain and preached the gospel for a period of time. We just don't have the evidence. Now, there are references. Some of you may be interested in pursuing a little further study of uh, I have a, a copy here of the, the search for the 12 apostles written by William Stewart McBurney. It's interesting here, page 225, McBurney writes, the idea that Paul or other apostles may have visited and ministered in England does not find much serious consideration or even interest among most church historians. They may be right, but there is too much evidence of at least the bare possibility of apostolic journeys there for serious scholars to dismiss the question out of hand. So McBurney says, yeah, most just reject the idea, but reality is there's a lot of evidence floating around out there. We can't just completely dismiss it. Now, another book, hard to find, St. Paul in Britain. St. Paul in Britain, author R.W. Morgan. Um, fascinating book, but Morgan discusses Christianity being taken to Britain by Joseph of Arimathea. He even says that Lazarus traveled with him. Also later, kind of the dominant force there was Simon the Zealot, who was one of the, one of the apostles. Also, a man named Aristobulus, who is mentioned different places. 
But Morgan writes quite a bit about this very close, intimate friendship that existed between Paul and the royal family of Britain. All right, let me roll, scroll on up here. Here's the drama of the lost disciples. Different color cover than my than my copy has, but uh, George Jowett. Um, he writes Jowett writes quite a bit about the history of Rome's various wars um, on first century Britain. In fact, he says there were like sixty wars or, or excuse me, major battles. At one point, the British king is taken captive. He is tried, and he is sent to Rome and required to live there with his family for seven years. Now, names from the royal, the British royal family that he lists, there's a genealogy laid in the book, and he mentions Caractacus was the king. And from the family, Claudia, and then names like Linus and Rufus and Pudens. So we have one more pastoral epistle to look at, and that's Second Timothy. So we read at the end of Titus where Paul was went, intending to winter at Nicopolis. During the intervening years since the first imprisonment, Rome had burned and the Jews had revolted in Judea. Christians and Jews were viewed negatively. You know, if Paul had still, still been a prisoner, when these events took place, he may never have been released. But they, uh, Christians and Jews, and Paul was both. They have a, they're in very, negative view of the Roman Empire. Okay, Second Timothy 4, verse 6. Paul says, I am ready to be poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. So the trial has taken place. It did not go well. Uh, there were there was no one but Luke who stayed with him. He was sentenced to die. Verse 7, he's finished his race and kept the faith. Verse 8, there's a crown of righteousness laid up for him. But then he writes to Timothy, verse 9, be diligent to come to me quickly. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, departed for Thessalonica. Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, as a part of the old former Yugoslavia there in the Balkans. Now, whether Cretans and Titus deserted Paul, um, I think we need to be a little cautious there. Maybe they were sent there. But essentially, these servants who had been with Paul, you know, have fanned out now. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark, bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. So Paul had a job for John Mark. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. So where was Timothy? He was left at Ephesus to combat some of the heresies. So now Tychicus is coming to relieve him. Bring the cloak, uh, jacket or robe that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. And these books and parchments most likely were books of, scrolls of, books of the New Testament that were being gathered, that were being sent perhaps to Peter and or to John for, you know, kind of the final canonization gathering. And let's see, verse 16, uh, my first defense, no one stood with me, but they all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Verse 17, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. 
And we saw that in the book of Acts through so many times through Paul's ministry, that the very bleakest of times that Christ would appear to him to, to strengthen him. So that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of a lion. Well, um, being thrown to the beasts was a common way the Christians were killed. But Paul was a Roman citizen. And as a citizen, his death is understood to have been by a beheading. But now let's scroll down a little bit further and we see some interesting names listed. Notice verse 21. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. Again, we don't want to take a giant shoehorn and force an interpretation in here. But from history, the British royal family of the second half of the first century had names like Caractacus, Claudia, Linus, Rufus, Pudens, and here are so many of the names listed right here, there in Rome with Paul. So he sends greetings on their behalf. Were these one and the same? You know, were these those with him, members of the British royal family? Well, once again, we have to honestly say the Bible doesn't say. But there is so much evidence that is fascinating to consider. But uh, again, as long as it is uh, filtered through the, the fact that uh, if it's scripture, we can absolutely rely on it. If it's not, let us uh, have a degree of caution.